Welcome to A Little Bit Radical, a business podcast from Standing on Giants. I'm Rob, your host. Join me as I meet people and organisations who are doing things differently, challenging the status quo and yes, might just be a little bit radical. How is your mental health right now? This is a question that you may be asking yourself more and more recently. According to Mind, one in four of us will experience a mental health problem this year. And if you look around your peer group and yourself, that might even seem a bit low. It does to me, certainly. Today, I'm speaking to Paul Smith, who has lived with a little bit radical ethos throughout his whole professional career and is now turning his attention to this problem, running Jack at Work, the B2B side of the groundbreaking mental health platform, Jack. Jack stands for Just Ask a Question. It was founded by Danny Gray, and it's a free online platform curating high-quality video interviews with an incredible range of mental health and wellness experts, as well as high-profile advocates like actor David Harewood, political heavyweight Alistair Campbell, and England rugby star Marcus Smith. The platform is free for the general public, funded by businesses who take on the Jack at Work product to support their internal programs. I'm very excited to welcome Paul to the podcast. Hello. Rob, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Paul. How are you? I'm very, very good, thank you. And thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us. So, Paul, if you are a little bit radical, and you're on our podcast, so we know you are, what do you think in your early life set you up for that? Honestly, I have no idea. Because I'm probably the least radical. I was lazy as a youngster, if I'm being perfect. It's like really, really lazy. I don't think I started walking until I was about four or five. So nobody's going to be more surprised about my radicalness than probably my parents, to be fair. I think my mum and dad have always been driven, always been really, really kind of driven. And my dad loves doing all these different projects. So I think he's always kind of had that radical element to him, which rubbed off on me. Probably not in the younger years, but certainly when I gave up my footballing dream and I went into the working world and I probably was seen as a little bit of a maverick, even in organisations where it's like, you come in, you do your job and that's kind of it. And even then I was like trying to push boundaries and trying to kind of really sway away from what other people were doing or what they were telling me to do because I could see different ways of doing things. So I'm not sure whether that's radical at all, but there was certain elements of that where I was like, actually, you know what? there is something else out there, something else that I can be doing, something else I should be doing. You mentioned your footballing dream there. I can't let that sit. So tell us about your footballing dream and where you got to with that. Yeah, I guess I was all right, to be fair. I played kind of county level, I played for Reading from a young age. I played for Ipswich. I guess I only got 17, 18 and there's levels, right? So I knew I was good, but I think you had to be kind of exceptional. I'd put no element of thought into what I might do if I didn't make as a footballer. So I was a little bit screwed when I got taken in moments which say, unfortunately, we're letting you go. And then I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. So I was really, really quite good. I mean, my parents, I spoke about them just a second ago about how radical they are, but they're also just awesome people. Like we were traveling around the country. Nothing was ever too much. My dad, after a massive week, would just go, right, okay, up we get, let's go, we'll train, we'll do this. So I think that kind of set me up. I think you see quite a lot of elite sports people that go into consulting and mindset and resilience and talking to corporations, I think. So even though they make it as a footballer, I think some of that passion and the dedication that I had growing up, I think has definitely stood me in good stead for where I am now. That's a really good answer. When you've pursued a career like that, a dream career, and got quite far with it where it's a a kind of a real prospect that then for whatever reason you can't pursue it it then i'm going to talk about my own experience here so my first career was in professional acting and i did do that for about five years which is very much kind of similar to being a footballer dream career you know highly competitive only a certain number of people will get to that level in the end i actually just really hated it though being an actor is horrible but then when i went into the business world i kind of had this thing of well well i've already followed my dream and got quite far and seen the reality of that and so anything now will be sort of a bonus actually I don't need to be that anxious about where my business career goes because I'm proving to myself that I can do other things I guess. Was that mindset shift for you going from the career that you thought was exactly what you wanted to do to then realizing that it's not quite what you wanted to then actually pivoting into something else was that difficult for you to transition into? That was hard, and I describe it as a bit of a grieving process, actually. When it came to the point of making a decision, it didn't feel like a hard decision to make. felt like the most empowering decision at that time. You know, calling my agent, and I should say, do you know what? I'm done. I've had a great five or six years, but this isn't for me anymore. I'm going to do something else. 
and that felt good. But then there definitely was a grieving process. And I think it was more for the identity of being an actor as opposed to working in acting. Do you think there's something similar with football, the identity of a footballer, giving that up? There's a huge amount about that. We could put that into kind of many different sectors, I think. I started kind of really working closely with an ex-professional footballer and we were talking about identity and he was saying the amount of youngsters that are 10, 11, 12, 13, where they introduce themselves and they start introducing themselves straight away as, oh, I'm a footballer. It's like, well, now how would your nan introduce you? Because your nan wouldn't introduce you as a footballer. So I think that identity part plays a massive, massive key in how people perceive themselves and then how they want to be perceived by others. And I think the same when you're in the military, that is your whole identity. You transition out, you've got to try and find your own identity. And the same as, I guess, kind of acting and thereafter. So I think identity plays a massive part, not just in the sporting world, actually, well, I think it plays a huge part in everyday life. This is problematic, isn't it? It's problematic when our work, what we do for money, encroaches on every aspect of our life, isn't it? If you were to go down the pub and speak to somebody and somebody says, oh, you've not met this person before, one of their first questions will be, well, what did you do as a job then? Nearly every single time where we would. Think back to the five, 10, 15 conversations you've had, laughs with somebody that you didn't know. Probably what you do comes up within the first two questions. Yeah, we're really tied into that. And I'd like to talk about you as you move through your professional career now. You, of course, worked in the recruitment space. So finding people their dream job, you know, that would give them this identity and a sense of purpose, but in quite a different way. Give us a short little summary of that journey and what that was like. Yeah, I don't think it was in a different way at the beginning. I think it was kind of how probably people have that perception of the recruitment world was kind of what I was working in. And I think it all changed when myself, Dave and Patrick got off the opportunity to, or we created the opportunity, I guess, to build our own business, knowing that we were really, really different. And actually we did care. It wasn't just about doing the least amount of work for the maximum amount of money. It was actually the people we're finding jobs for. You do care about, they spend more time at work and the clients, we want them to actually feel that they're getting really good value for money. So we just wanted to do something that was way way above and beyond what ordinarily a recruitment process would be so what could we do how could we push boundaries how could we in a very very small way have a tiny impact on improving the perception of the recruitment world to other people to say actually it's not all quite sharky it's not all very greedy it's not all wolf of wall street actually there are some really really good people trying to do the right thing and that's been difficult i mean even when we speak to clients like not you again like recruitment but I think over time, you get to work with the clients that actually really do value what you do. And we're probably, from a commercial perspective, we're certainly not as cutthroat as we could be, but we can sleep at night. We love what we do. We've got a team that really, really cares. We're a certified B Corp. We're Planet Mark certified. We offset every single candidate's carbon footprint for the past 12 months of their role. And then we also put them through mental health first aid training. So we're trying to really kind of make sure that we do things very, very differently. Now, those businesses for our listeners are Disrupt, which is the recruitment agency that you're talking about, Paul, and Includability, which uh, I gather is a community-based company, really connecting businesses together to improve their wellness programs, sustainability programs, whatever it might be. We're going to find out more about those businesses when we meet your co-founder in a later episode, because you've recently transitioned, not fully out of that business, clearly, but operationally into taking on this huge job, being managing director of Jack at Work. So let's talk about Jack now and tell us about that business and what you're trying to achieve there. Quite simply, I guess, we're trying to change the world of mental health one question at a time. I think fundamentally, that's our mission. We want to positively impact one billion people. For those that don't kind of know the backdrop of Jack, it was founded by a gentleman called Danny Gray. He suffers with body dysmorphic disorder from a young age, was bullied. And it took him an awful long time to reach out. And between reaching out and doing something, he started using his sister's makeup. That made him feel much better. He then thought, well, why is there not makeup for men? So created a men's makeup brand called Warpaint for Men. Went on Dragon's Den. Started telling his story. And when that story started to land with people, and when he launched it, the response was overwhelming. The response was massive by people, not about the product, but actually about somebody saying, I feel exactly the same way. That's how I feel. That's how my son feels. That's how my partner feels. And he couldn't go back to them all. And the very, very basis of Just Ask Question Jack was founded because of the amount of people who were getting in touch with him that shared his story, that felt the same way as he did, that he didn't know what to do about it. You have to talk about mental health, and, and we do. But actually, sometimes you need to listen to other people's mental health. You have to listen to other people's stories. And actually, that provides a degree of reassurance or hope or inspiration. We've been extremely lucky in that we've had incredible investors that believe in the mission. 
So we've been allowed to build the product that we know is going to have an impact in the wider world. But we also knew that at some point in the not too distant future, we would have to try and find a, a revenue making model that could support that. We launched the second iteration, the most recent one that people can see on Jack.org back in November. And the response was massive. The response was incredible and it still continues to be. But we were having corporates reaching out to us to say, are you going to have a workplace version of this? We think there's something that you could do. My role being that of supporting corporates with mental health, sustainability, quality, diversity and inclusion, talent management, leadership and governance meant that we've built this huge community of incredible people. Um, when I got started to see kind of Dan Cook and Nanny Gray from Jack, it kind of made sense that when we needed to build this proposition, it ties in with my mission and my values. It's making an impact in the wider world. And so when I was offered the opportunity to kind of help build something that I know is going to have a legacy way beyond me, because it's way bigger than me, it was just too good to turn down. Absolutely. How are you finding transitioning from being a founder and the boss to being employee? How's that, really? how's that going? <laughs> I was about to swear then. It was really hard. It was really hard for eight and a half years where I could kind of always be seen, I guess, as that visionary of like, okay, great. I want to do something. We're going to go and do it. Okay, great. I've got this idea. We're going to go and do it. Not all of them were successes, of course, but there was literally no reins on me. It was, you got an idea, wake up at two o'clock in the morning, write something down, create a business plan, and then try and get everyone else on board. And I think that transition into, I've still got all of those ideas and I can still obviously have an input, a big input in disrupt and includability. But for Jack at work, it was also actually, there's other people here that needs to be a conversation with. So that was quite difficult. No, I'm not going to lie, there was frustrations and there probably will be in the future still. But it's a transition that I professionally know that I'm going to be better as a person. It's going to challenge me because of the breadth of people that we have kind of around us. And also the very mission that we have is large and is vast which only is going to provide us with problems. But it was a difficult transition. Brilliant because they're an awesome bunch of people and I couldn't be more inspired every single day. But letting go of that control and then knowing that I'm going into something that I don't have that free element to go, okay, I've got an idea. We're going to go with it. Actually, there's a process to go through and not all of them will be agreeing with me. Of course. Yeah, I can see how that's a challenge. But I think it's a little bit of a radical move for yourself to challenge yourself to do that, kind of refer to this as putting yourself into the stretch zone, don't we? Rather than staying in your comfort zone. So I think that's always to be admired. Talk us through like the user experience, if you like, of Jack. For those who've never heard of it at all, what is it and how do people use it? So fundamentally, the Jack.org and the Jack at Work uses the same technology. So we've created in-house a short form video Jack player, which essentially is if somebody was to come on and ask me a question, pre-recorded, I would be talking back at them with an the answer. So we've utilized that technology where we filmed with experts, clinicians, psychologists, psychotherapists, doctors, and medical professionals to cover, I guess, a huge range of topics. So when you do go on, there'll be a huge list of questions that you can ask. Most of which have been written by me of the .org and at work, I reckon I've probably written 90 to 95% of them and filmed them as well. So you go on there as a user and you ask a question that actually matters to you, whether that is because you're living through something yourself or a loved one is living through that as well, and you want to know more. And that was one of the things that Danny was really, really keen to make sure that we cover off is it's not just about the person living through something. It's actually about that support network. It's about sometimes the support that somebody's going through that we filmed on Bereaved by Suicide. You know, we filmed with four or five people now who have gone through the same life experience and deal with it in very, very different ways. And there isn't a right or a wrong way to deal with something like that. And actually what we want to do is provide people with the degree of reassurance that how you feel is absolutely fine. And then the same goes with neurodiversity. We filmed on autism, Asperger's, dyslexia, dyspraxia. And then we filmed on addictions and eating disorders. And you know, we've just filmed on so much that we just want to make sure that what somebody might be going through, we're looking to cover either now and have done or certainly in the future. It's a nice, easy to use, bite-sized video format where we can go on, ask a question. On the free side, they can actually create their own boards so they could create something if they wanted to share it with somebody else, they could just share that with somebody else to have an impact. One thing I've noticed when I've gone on the .org platform, the public platform, is just when you see the videos and the experts that you've curated, I see, just at a glance, professor, professor, doctor, professor, professor, doctor, doctor, doctor. And in this area of mental health, presumably that is so important to get the right experts there talking about the right issue. So how do you approach that at Jack and Jack at Work? 
So we have a board of advisors, essentially. So what we want to do is make sure that we are the right place to go with either industry leading or world leading doctors, professors, psychologists, psychotherapists, medical professionals. So everything that we do is underpinned with exceptionally talented, best in their field people telling you from a factual perspective what this is, why does it happen, what could I do? And then we revise that. So we have a travel guiding system, which is basically which of the questions that won't ever need to change. That's just what it is. Then we've got the Amber ones, which is like, actually, we need to keep an eye on this because if legislation changes or if something comes out, and then we've got the red ones that are reviewed on a six to eight week basis with our list of advisors who are as experts that you see on our panel, but also then some of our investors and our external advisors. Oh, wow. So you have some topics that you're reviewing as regularly as every six or eight weeks and it's updated accordingly. If we want to get the right information at the right time, it's important that that information is continually revised because there'll be some sort of white paper that would have been put out there in two years ago that takes that much time for it to kind of go through. So we just want to make sure that whilst it's not going to be every single question and they are the exception, we do want to make sure that the ones that are more deemed high risk we've just got to focus on. Let's talk about the workplace now and how big a problem is poor mental health in the workplace? And maybe then if I were to phrase the question in another way, what is the opportunity for businesses by supporting their team's mental health? I think very simply, Rob, without people, there are no businesses anyway. And I think if you take mental well-being as a whole, and it is all of us all of the time, every single day, the reality is there is no work-life balance. I would say that there are very few people who can have a life balance, something goes on in their life and they don't in some way, shape or form take that into their work. And there are so many different things that impact somebody's mental health. So I think it's massively important that organisations actually don't deem mental health as a box ticking exercise. We don't want to be doing is perpetuating the problem within an industry. Yeah, you know, we know that there are a huge amount of incredibly good apps, products, provisions, support out there, but they're all to a degree largely underutilized. Their usage rates are really quite low, anywhere between kind of three and a half and six percent if they're lucky. We were speaking to a big PMI provider and between mental health and cancer, the rise on mental health support and costs is rising, and that's now with dependence as well. So you only have to kind of look at some way by proxy if you're affected at home by somebody living with a mental health illness or condition that is going to affect you at work. So the more we can provide that psychologically safe space for employees to speak, educate managers to actually know when to spot when something might not be going quite so well. If they did open up, if an employee delivered up to a manager, would they know what to say? Would they know when just to listen? And if there was a product or propositional provision in place, would they know where to direct them? When building Jack at Work, I took the brain of a HR director and I tried to figure out what on earth they have to do to support their employees. What do they have to do to appease C-suite and, and kind of investors? And that's kind of how I decided to build this product out. And then what I wanted to do is the product offering besides the tech was put on events, bring our experts to life, build some Jack champions. So these are ambassadors of Jack that we will give insights to get them to meet the experts. We'll get them to talk about their own experience because we know firsthand, the power of storytelling is massive. So if you can show your vulnerability, you can genuinely provide that psychologically safe space, people will feel better about their mental health. And then if we can enhance and complement what they're already investing in by directing them when they go on to a question about their mental health, if they've got a product, we can signpost them to that usage as well. So we should very much see ourselves as that kind of intervention prevention space. And the more that individuals, employees, can be educated and building their knowledge, their confidence builds, and hopefully they don't get to that point. There will still be some, of course. We're never ever going to solve the world of mental health or well-being at work. But I do believe that we've got a product that is innovative and that can really help drive better mental health, better well-being and visibility. Completely. So what were the top things when you came up with that HR director persona that they have to deal with? What were the top things that stood out for you? how hard their job is. Even being involved in intuitability, the reason that's been the success that it is, is people quite often crave human interaction. Yeah, you know, there's a huge amount of things that dump data on the back end and then at some point it just adds to somebody's workload. There's always a narrative of you need to do more, you need to do more, you need to do this, you need to do that. And it's actually, there are an awful lot of people that do some incredible things, but quite a lot of the time it falls within an HR department 
and they're expected to know everything. They're expected to be, from an ED and I perspective, mental health, well-being, sustainability, leadership and governance, talent management. All of a sudden, they're meant to know all of this stuff and probably with a minimal budget and a reduction in staff since COVID. So that was the route I wanted to take was how can we really support them? How can we be an incredible asset to a HR department? Because being a big, good asset to a HR department, probably supporting the wider workforce. And then just sort of speaking to them, I tried to understand in construction, what's your main challenge? And we know that construction has the largest suicide rate out of all the industries. Well, we then partnered with Lighthouse Charity and we're filming with them to talk to them. And then we're speaking to the MD of a big construction firm, the lady who created the Women in Construction Awards and say, well, what do we need to do? And then we're doing the same in retail. We're doing the same in financial services, the same in sports to try and actually break down all of these different elements that provide a challenge and then we'll go and film with them and so that actually the product has the most impact. So you've mentioned a few things that Jack at Work would provide or partner with an organization on so the team get access to the platform, you run a series of events, there's an ambassador program, they give us like the full suite of services that you provide and how they all sort of work together. So clearly first you've got the technology. So the technology is the platform that is accessible to every single employee. Importantly for us, it's psychologically safe. It's completely anonymous. So it's single sign-on. So the data that the employer receives is entirely, so what questions have been asked? What's the main topics? What's the top asked questions? How many minutes of answers have been listened to overall globally across their business? How many minutes per user per session are they on? How many questions per user per session are they on? So that hopefully either reaffirms their current strategies to say, oh, do you know, we're on the right lines and great, we'll continue. Or maybe it reaffirms what they're doing and saying, no, reaffirms to say, yes, we're doing the right thing or realigns to say, we need to be doing this because we haven't actually thought of it. Then obviously the events, monthly webinars, dropping sessions, takeovers on the topics that actually do mean a lot. So we'll be taking that data from individual companies and then taking a global stance on what are the main topics and then using our experts across the free platform and across our work platform to then start with those questions. You also mentioned the Jack Champions. We're building a big community, which is cross company employee resource groups. So that's something that really excites me is being somebody who's passionate about building a community is you've got some chairs and co-chairs of incredible organizations driving change across their business across a multitude of employee resource groups. When we can start bringing them together to share what they're doing, we're not asking them to share the innermost secrets of their business. We're not asking them to share what their next incredible products going to be we're saying if you're doing well-being and mental health well that is our responsibility to share it and get talking and empower each other so hopefully it brings a new freshness and then we work with a lot of smes who have expressed an interest who don't have ergs so then they can join the groups that they're really interested in and they can go away and probably still teach and empower other people that are in it underneath what we are we're an incredible marketing and creative agency so we have the best creative team that we put on takeover days and activation events where we bring our experts to life in person through multiple formats. And then we have bespoke conversations. So that is where we bring senior leaders, people with a story across their business, sat in a chair and they sit exclusively on that platform. Or we bring benefits providers, EAPs or mental health provisions or products to life. And then we link those through to the questions that then hopefully enhances the usage. We are driving the mission. I think that's the most important thing that we're doing is this is created because we need to make sure that Jack the Orc stays free forever with no barriers. That for me is our biggest thing. So I was interested though, which you say, which is you are building a community and you are building a kind of an ecosystem. And you talked about the incredible low adoption of services that often businesses are paying for already and providing and no one's using them. But you're actually using the Jack at Work platform to create a bit more engagement around some of their other offerings that they have and maybe explain a bit more about what it involves and how to use it and that will overall increase that adoption and help the overall issue exactly all we'll do is enhance and complement what they're already doing so we could be that one platform that an organization could use or whatever they've got generally speaking any organization over a certain size is going to have a big suite of benefits already available what can we do to further enhance that and amplify their voice? I w- was lucky enough to come to your launch event just shortly before recording and listen to some of the experts that you've brought on board and some of the businesses and things like that. And one thing that really impressed me, I think, about the whole approach is an awareness of 
intersectionality, to give it the sociologist's term. So an understanding that you can't really talk about mental health without talking about prejudice and diversity, equity and inclusion, about the difference between being a woman in the workplace or a person of colour in the workplace and how that impacts their mental health around gender and gender identity and how that can impact mental health. And I think really strong on the platform is about bringing those issues to light as well and being able to ask questions about those issues. Could you tell us about that and how that's viewed internally and how that's been brought to life? For me, it was something that was well thought out is because from building includability and when I was speaking to people, the amount of fear that people have when it comes to not wanting to start a conversation or perhaps they want to ask a question but don't necessarily know how to ask it for the fear of causing offence. And that's where I think that not to take a soft stance but actually to take an understanding stance of it's really difficult to know everything about everything and yet that's the expectation is that we're going to know everything about everything which is just unrealistic. And the thing I love is it's a never-ending journey. Like We're never going to run out of people to film because if we think about kind of cultural intelligence, if we think about ED&I, we break ED&I down, and then we think about climate anxiety. And somebody that cares about ED&I might not necessarily even give two hoots or even think about climate anxiety, and yet it is genuinely a real thing. We think about AI anxiety and actually people fearing for their jobs. These are all topics that we're going to be really filming on to say, does that have to impact you right here, right now? And you don't have to share the same views as every single person. If we think about multi-generational talent, within organizations, somebody who's perhaps 65 probably won't have the same thought process and feelings as somebody who's 22, 23 and just kind of left university. They're going to be at very different points with very different feelings towards certain things. And it's not about saying, oh, I completely agree with you. It's about saying, okay, I don't really understand that, but I'm going to go and educate myself. So that is well within our capabilities is we can educate people. And the more we're educated, the better colleagues we can be. Then hopefully from an EVB perspective, it's used well, it can help attract talent. And then if we're better informed, we're better educated, more knowledgeable, then it can help kind of retain talent. Because if we can just improve confidence, then we're doing a really, really good thing. From a mental health perspective, if that means that it can be an intervention or a prevention, because they are more understanding about the importance of gut health, diet, nutrition, burnout, what are the stages of burnout? And where am I on that spectrum? And what can I do? What's within my capabilities to reduce that? There are some things that you probably can't control, but there's an awful lot that we can control as individuals. So that for me is kind of the really, really exciting thing is that willingness for us to kind of push boundaries, listen, like we want to remove every element of assumption on the future evolution of Jack at work, bring people that are in this business day in, day out, Jack champions from every single part of a business telling us what is it that we need to film and then we'll go and find it and film it. Fantastic. Thank you. Obviously, you've seen a lot of campaigns, a lot of programs around mental health, a lot of initiatives, both in your role at Jack and at Includability and Disrupt. It's the kind of area where there's always going to have been more to do, but was there a moment or was there a particular campaign or program or long-term strategy that you've seen where you're like, this business has smashed it out of the park? on tackling mental health or wellness or inclusion or anything like that? In reality, no, I don't think so. I think some media campaigns are really, really good. And I think some products are really, really good. How have they smashed it out of the park? Are they getting the usage? Are they getting the uptake? Is it having the desired effect? I'm not sure. I think there needs to be much more collaboration. There needs to be a need for all of these incredible people to come together to understand the wider impact. So that's probably not the answer that you wanted or what we're kind of hoping for, but can't pinpoint one product or one campaign or one long-term strategy where I think you've absolutely smashed it. I think there's a lot that's been done that's really, really good. Don't get me wrong. It must be very motivational for you because you can see the need, right? <laughs> you can see the need. You don't think someone has cranked this yet. But I think we're going to crack it. And I think that that's kind of really, really important to state is we are not going to solve every single company's mental well-being problems because that has to be down to the individual. That has to be down to the business to provide that safe space for people to want to come and talk. What we can provide is a really, really safe space for somebody to come and ask questions knowing they're not going to be either offending someone because they're asking that particular question or fearing for their progression because their, their manager's going to find out or their business is going to find out. So we can provide that really safe space on a huge breadth of topic 
where somebody feels safe and then they can join the groups that they really want to. And if they feel empowered to do so, they can become a Jack champion and then kind of start spreading that message. Internally, we want to amplify their voices, their stories to show that vulnerability is okay. And then if we can start to work from the top down on what are you actually doing to create a psychologically safe space? So don't just say you are, but what are you actually doing? And then it's got to come from the top down. We will work from the bottom up as well, but it has to come from there to genuinely make people feel comfortable with speaking up about something. They've heard something they don't agree with. Do they know where to go? Do they know that they're going to be treated with the desired passion and authenticity that it deserves? And that is where I think that we can have that really big impact is for me, the collaboration effort and dropping the competitiveness. I love the other work that some mental health and wellbeing operators do. I want to learn from them. I want us to build a product that can sit alongside. If I said that we're the best, we're only the best for a certain period of time. And who's deeming us the best? Because sooner or later, there's going to be another product that will come out that they're the best. So why don't we just create something that's absolutely incredible, that works hand in hand, that can really drive change. And then the legacy is much greater than just being number one for a short space of time. Couldn't agree more. Collaboration over competition. We spoke to uh, Paul Skinner, the guy who wrote a book called Collaborative Advantage, which was all about this. It's a good listen. He's an incredibly knowledgeable guy and very kind of cerebral guy. And he's got a wonderful voice. So I'd recommend that episode. And speaking of recommendations, Paul, I'd like to ask you, what's the Jack talk that has made the biggest impact on your life? That is a very good question. There are a couple, I think. Alice Hendy's story. Alice lost her brother Josh to suicide when he was 21. And I've known Alice for a couple of years and then had the privilege of working on 100 to 150 questions, talking about that traumatic life experience, even going to the questions, what it was like kind of post that with the police coming around. And it's those things that to me can have that profound effect that we are never ever going to solve the problem of suicide never like we want to really enhance the conversation we want to make sure that people feel really comfortable as do an awful lot of incredible charities and people that have gone through something like that but the way she talks about it is this is how she dealt with it this is how they dealt with it as a family and the level of reassurance that that can bring it shouldn't be underestimated and that's all of these incredible mental health ambassadors and advocates telling their stories, being brave enough to share their stories. And Alice set up an organization called Ripple, which is a, a suicide prevention tool. So if they've deployed it across the Wi-Fi network, whether it's kind of self-harm or suicidal techniques, then it will pop up with a message of hope and give people time to kind of breathe and reflect and think and then you know, direct them to other kind of resources. And that's amazing. So if they're searching for that type of content, it will pop up as a kind of preventative intervention exactly that yeah i'm really pleased to say that hopefully by the time this goes out we would have announced a partnership with ripple for jack and jack at work so that we'll be deploying it across any organization that then kind of partners with jack at work because fundamentally our main goal is around mental health yes we're going to film on ed and i guess we're going to film on sustainability but mental health is i guess that core reason as to why we exist in the first instance so that's definitely one. And then Leah Charles King is kind of another one who lives with bipolar. She's a presenter on A Place in the Sun and just listening to her story. We have Shakira Akabusi, who's Chris Akabusi's daughter and her life with postpartum depression. I think it's just an incredible, incredible story. I mean, I, I feel knackered when I listen to it, when I spoke to her, when I repeat it. That's probably the three episodes that I would are the conversations that they're definitely going to ask some questions on those. Oh, fantastic. Will do. Will do. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for not being afraid of being put on the spot. Well, put me on the <laughs> spot. As well. It's great to hear. It's great to hear these stories. So we're going to move on to our final section of the interview now, which is about a little bit radical world. Obviously, you're involved in something that matters to the world at large a lot. Your daily work is so related to a big global issue. But what's a change that you would like to see in the world that you perhaps don't impact on a daily basis? What would that be? There is so much, so much change that you would like to see. I think the one thing that we would never change is that I just want people to be more present. I think there are so many things that make people busy, that make people not have the time for each other, whether that is relationship, whether it's financial, whether it's work, whether it's TV, whether it's social media. Actually having a conversation, being there for each other, being there for children, being there and actually in the room and, and wanting to kind of be there. I think the art of that is being lost and I would love to see that really come back. 
and just see people kind of interact and connect and that's what i would really really love to see i see so many people who either don't ask a question or do ask a question and they're just not there or i see parents with their children and think that's so special like that's a really special moment and it's being taken for granted i had a conversation with a client yesterday and i put on a couple of webinars and we hosted them together and i said oh what's next he said actually i'm stepping away from my mental health ambassador role within the organization he said because it's just another thing. He's just had a, his second child. And he said, I just don't feel that I'm giving them enough. It's like, actually, at what point do I start to think I should have given that time to my child? And that's what I would like to see more, I think. I think that's a perfect answer. That's very, very powerful. I'm sure you'd have lots of people signing up for that and recognizing that in themselves and other people. And so we're at the end of our time together now. Thank you so much for telling us all about Jack at Work and about your little bit of radical life and everything that you've been involved with, which is all really fantastic. The final question is always the same, which is there's someone listening out there who's got a little bit of a radical idea. You're a founder of a business. You've done exciting things. They want to get it off the ground. What advice would you give them if they don't know where to start? Go for it. You have to go for it, like without a shadow of a doubt. There will be people who will be naysayers. There will be people who are saying it's probably going to be too expensive or it might not take off or there's another product similar or there's another idea similar. The idea is extremely relevant to you as an individual and you're passionate about it. And your passion might just be something that is more than that of somebody else. I would prefer to say to somebody, you've got to do it. And then if it fails, you can look back and reflect. But failing and reflecting is only going to be learning. Whereas if you don't do it, you're just going to be thinking, what if? What if? I had this great idea once. Act upon it, build a plan. You don't need to know every single element. What I've learned is we started with a five-year business plan. We didn't know what was going to happen in the next six months. So write your ideas down, get people involved, get people kind of bought into what you're trying to do. And that comes through passion, determination, having the knowledge, of course, to know how you're going to try and not every element of this to really apply it. But you know most of it because it's in your head and you've got the idea for a reason. So my suggestion to you is absolutely go for it. Go it with gusto and just live your dream. Outstanding, Paul. Thank you for that answer. We interviewed a guest yesterday, Carl Vey, who's the founder of a company called Sophie Health. And he had a lovely little soundbite, which is, ideas do not mature like a fine wine. They die on the vine. I've got ADHD. And as soon as the light gets switched off at night, my mind comes alive. So if anyone's out there that's got that idea and can do it, please make it happen. Well, funnily enough, Calve, who I just mentioned, Sophie Health, is a botanical formulation of plants to help you <laughs> sleep, <laughs> but paired with technology to kind of make it very personalised and all the rest of it. So I'll be sending it's, it's that to you It's almost like we've actually this. planned this type of segment. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, and I've written so many business plans where some of these companies men are like, that's a great idea. And do you know what? Not all of them come to fruition. Not all of them I even take any further, but have a notepad by the side of your bed. Have something where if you wake up or something's there, just make notes of it because sooner or later you might just have the time or the energy to go, that's what I'm going to do. Paul, it's been fantastic to speak to you Thanks today. Thank you very much and hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please follow us on your podcast platform. If you'd like to appear on A Little Bit Radical or have an idea of someone we should speak to, please email podcast at standingongiants.com or get in touch with me on LinkedIn. You can search Rob Fawkes or search Standing on Giants and you'll find me there. Thank you very much and speak to you next time.